Hi everyone, my name's Royden, and in this video I'm going to take you through how to build the floor for the Primal Fires Pizza Oven Building Kit. Now the floor is often a very underrated part of a pizza oven, yet it's critically important because it's the surface we're actually cooking on, so we've got to get the components right. You'll see in this floor we have three layers. We have an insulation layer, we have a bedding mortar layer which serves to level these bricks and create an energy bank for the oven, and also a layer of the special high density fire bricks on top of the oven here. So what we're looking to do is achieve a base over which we build our oven. I'll just demonstrate that with the cardboard mould. This will then sit on top of here and we're going to build our oven over the top of the dome here and then it will land, the inside layer will land on the fire bricks here and we'll build our arch over here. Now you'll see this video length is about 30 to 40 minutes, which is quite a commitment on time, but it's part of our endeavour to provide a high level of information for the novice builder. So if you are a super experienced person at this sort of project, you might want to just refer to the written instructions only, but if you're a novice, this is going to give you a high level of detail that will give you the confidence to jump in and do this project yourself to get the right result, to get an oven that you're going to love for many, many years and one that will be the envy of your friends and the pivot point of your social life, hopefully. So we're going to jump into it, we'll look at the tools that you need and then we'll jump into the actual build process itself. So let's get going. Just want to quickly cover off the gear we need for this part of the project. So you'll need a small angle grinder. If you haven't got one, just a cheap and cheerful one's fine. Recommend 115mm if you're going to buy one. Also a sharp hand saw just for cutting through the insulation a dead blow hammer or a little rubber mallet They're just for gently tapping the bricks down in place. We don't want to use steel, so if you haven't got one, you can just use a piece of wood. We do need a pencil, a ruler, a tape measure, and a Phillips head screwdriver. And in terms of the minimum safety gear, you'll need some gloves, glasses, ear muffs, and a dust mask. And those are primarily for cutting the bricks and insulation. You're also going to need a large mixing bucket, one that can take 30 kilos worth of water, a measuring jug so we can accurately measure the water that goes into it and a little trowel to push the mortar around once it's in place. And not pictured here, we're also going to need a large level or something that's straight and strong over a metre long so that we can level our mortar off in place. And you'll see that in the coming video. Now, I would recommend going onto our website and checking out the packs for building the concrete slabs. We have some really cool additives that make this concrete slab a lot stronger and, uh, and easier to make up, so check those out. Now the great thing about having a cardboard mould is that we can place it on the concrete slab and get an idea about where our oven's gonna sit. Now the cardboard mould represents the inside of the oven, so obviously all our layers are gonna run out from this, so this is gonna be the central part of our oven. We don't wanna go any closer than 150 mils from the cardboard mould to the outside of the slab. That's got to allow for enough materials to go on the outside. So you're allowing for roughly 40 or 50 mil worth of refractory mortar over the dome, 50 mil worth of insulation, and then about 50 mil worth of shaping and waterproof coats that are going on the outside. So once you're happy with the placement of the oven, if you're going just in the middle of the, the slab itself, you don't need to be too worried about marking anything. But if, for example, you were offsetting it, moving it to one side, a bit closer, leave a bit of room for some pizzas or plates and drinks and things on one side, then you want to take a tape measure and just measure the different sides to make sure you're happy with the placement and then mark off the centre of the oven where you want it to sit, both here and at the front. So that's the great thing about the cardboard mould. You can wiggle it around, have a look from a distance, just make sure you're happy with the, uh, with the appearance of everything. So once we've done that, it's time to move on and do the insulation for the slab. So let's have a look at that now. So in your pizza oven pack, you're going to receive two high density insulation boards, just like this. They are 500 wide by 1000 long. So in short, with insulation in these ovens, the better the insulation, the quicker the, the oven will heat up, the longer it will retain heat for roasting and that sort of thing, and the less fuel it will use over the running period. So you're not losing heat out, so it's retaining more in the oven, basic common sense. So let's quickly cover off why we insulate. Basically, if we just had a fire on our fire bricks, straight like this, we're going to lose a huge amount of heat energy from these fire bricks into the concrete slab. Now, this concrete slab isn't designed to take a lot of heat. Cement in itself starts to break down about 300 degrees. So 
It's not a good idea to superheat this. You're going to get a lot of cracking and spalling. If there's moisture caught in it, it's just, it's just not a good thing. The second part is that we need to get these bio bricks up to about 350, 400 degrees. So when we slap a pizza on it, it's super, super hot and therefore it gives it that nice crispy uh, finish that we all love in our pizzas. So when we have it isolated on a piece of insulation like this, we don't lose the heat through the insulation board. It's retained in the bricks and therefore we get a better cooking result. Now I just want to look at the product itself because this high density board, it is quite pricey but it's a really really good material. I have soaked this for about two weeks in a bucket of water. It's starting to look a little bit scungy and slimy but I just want to demonstrate to you how strong this still is. So you'll see that can take 0.077 of a tonne with no problem at all, doesn't deform at all. So a really, really good product to be building our oven on. So I'm going to take you through the placement and trimming of the insulation boards now. But just before I do, I just want to quickly mention why I soaked that in uh, water for a couple of weeks. Seems a bit of a strange thing to do. But inadvertently, sometimes you get a bit of moisture inside your oven. So you might have left the door off and it rains or there's no chimney cap and a bit of moisture has got inside. You want to know that the materials you use in the oven can cope with that. Now you just have a series of small fires to dry everything back out again, but you want to make sure everything returns to uh, its original condition, which was just a little bit of uh, proof that that will happen. Now what we're looking to do is create a 60ml lip all the way around the outside of the dome. Now why that is, I'm just going to demonstrate. We're going to run a 40 to 50 mil layer of refractory mortar all the way on the outside of our cardboard mold here. And that's going to run down onto the top of our fire bricks. We're then going to run our ceramic fiber insulation over the top of that and run it down and connect it with our insulation board here. Over top of that, we're going to put a waterproofing layer which is going to come down and connect directly with the concrete half here. And there's various decorative layers, but that'll give you a basic idea of what we're trying to do. So we need to create a 60mm lip all the way around. As part of that, we need to trim off these corners and create the general shape of this pizza oven mould. If we don't, we've got fire bricks on the outside of the oven. Obviously when it rains, water's just going to hit that and go straight into the oven. And we have essentially an oven that needs drying out every time we go to use it. So that said, we have two sheets of 500mm wide insulation board. We need... 800 plus 60 mil each side, so 920. We've got a thousand mils there. So we need to trim 80 mils off. The other thing we've got to do is once we place this here and we have our 60 mils at the rear of the cardboard mold, that leaves us 60 mils at the front. So fortunately, we've got an off cut that we can use on the front. So what we're going to do to start is we are going to trim first 60 mils off and that's going to give us our 60 mil piece for the front and then we're going to take another 20 mils off. If you take the whole 80 mils off first it's just a little bit harder to trim that, that 20 mils off. So to do the trimming we're going to use a basic handsaw so uh, nothing special about it just a, a simple handsaw or if you've got one and feeling a bit lazy a, a jigsaw is quite good as well. Wouldn't recommend using a skill saw or a, a saw of any kind, a mechanical saw, because it just it just gets so dusty, it's going to throw things up everywhere. And this stuff is really easy to, to, to cut with a, a saw. But all dust is bad, so we're going to make sure we throw on our dust mask when we do that. So I'm going to get stuck in now and just trim this off, and then we'll pick up again on achieving the general shape of the oven. Right, I've skipped 10 minutes into the future. I have now trimmed my 80 mils off the sheet. I have my 60 mil off cut here and the 20 mil bit could just uh, just go into the rubbish somewhere. Now you won't have these lines marked yet, but I just put them on here so that I can help you understand what we're trying to achieve. First thing we're going to do is make sure that these sheets are located correctly. Now my total width here is now 920, so 460 will be the center of this total, total sheet here. This sheet is obviously larger than this one now so it's not going to be on our center line there. My slab here is 1200 wide 
So therefore, I can make a mark at 600. I know that's the middle. I can make a mark at 460 down here. And therefore, when I, make, when I match those two lines up, I know that this is gonna be sitting in the middle. I can then do the same on the front. So I can just measure across 600, 460 on the sheet, line that up. So therefore, I know this insulation sheet is sitting nice and central to my slab. If you were offsetting your oven on the slab, you'd be using the two marks that we made originally when we placed the cardboard mold on top of the slab. So you remember we just made a mark at the front and at the back. We can use those to centralize this insulation sheet. Right, the next part of the project is just to tidy up the front area here. So in your pack, you'll receive a piece of aluminum angle. So the, depending on the materials that you've got, the thickness of the insulation, your fire bricks, will just depend on how high this is. So that's gonna make the, that's gonna sit up the front here, and it's gonna act as something for us to place our insulation against, our mortar against, and our fire bricks. And it's gonna give us a nice tidy finish up the front of the oven, as well as uh, protect the front, front components from weather and things like that. So this little 60 mil piece that we've put in here, and this piece is obviously broken, uh, just needs to be trimmed to size. So the reason is that it's gonna sit on top of the bottom there of the aluminum angle. So it's actually gonna sit too high against this sheet here. And we need it to be level or below for when we put our mortar and boxing on, which you'll see in a minute. So you just need to go through and trim about 10 mil or something off the bottom of this. It's not hard cutting. I've just done this with a handsaw. Uh, it doesn't take long, a couple of minutes. So if the piece breaks, don't, don't sweat it at all, it's fine because there's not actually any insulation required up the front of the oven really, it's all sort of just needs to sit in place and then we're going to put a layer of mortar over the top so close enough is good enough for now so in your kit you're going to find some pre-cut aluminium angles we're going to use these to create a boxing around the outside here into which we're going to pour some refractory mortar now that refractory mortar is not only going to add to the density of the floor so it'll allow it to retain more heat but most importantly it will allow us to lay our fire bricks nice and level across the whole floor. Unfortunately, fire bricks are made with a few variances, so they can be one, two, three mil difference in thickness. And the last thing you want is a little brick sitting up high that will catch your pizza peel as you push the pizza in, uh, or catch a tray and that sort of thing. So we're going to get a nice level floor. You'll see that there are five that are the same. So you can start by working your way around just just put, popping them down for now because we're going to get serious about it later. As serious as we can get. And just roughly put them into place. You'll see there's a 22 and a half degree angle cut on these and that's going to match up on each side as you put it down. Now the easiest way to get this sort of straight is to measure the middle of this piece here. So it's one of the five pieces and line that up with the mark that you put on your insulation board for the centre here. So once that's in the centre, we can just sort of follow our 22 and a half degree angles and get that sitting nicely. So you'll see there are four bits left over. The two longer bits have a 45 degree angle cut in them and they match up into this 45 degree on the front bar there. Little hit, the little holes go downwards. So we can go around and match that up. Then you've got two bits left over. They can be a, a little bit of a puzzle to work out where they go, but generally speaking, it is pretty straightforward. What we want to do is just grab some of our fire bricks to the floor, just to double check our width of floor here. So I'm just going to grab four fire bricks in this case. check it's all nice and centered because that the middle of those two bricks there uh, is going to be right on my line that I've made on the uh, in the middle of this bar here so now we can just work our way around you don't need to watch me do this I'm just going to go work my way around make sure that everything is neat and tidy and ready to be marked 
So I've just taken a minute to go around and make sure everything's lying in the right position. I can do things like measure off this to the edge here, make sure that's the same as that one. I can measure off the side here and make sure it's the same as that side. And I can also get really carried away put my cardboard mould up here. Remember this is going to line up with that front bar so this will be just in front of the, the front bar there if not on it. And you can just do a little visual check to make sure you're going to have roughly 60, 50, 60 mils around the place. And I can see I've got a nice gap all the way around so I'm happy with where it's lying. I'm now going to take a pen, pencil, whatever, and I'm going to mark around the outside because we're going to cut these insulation boards off the concrete floor. So what we don't want to be doing is driving a saw into the concrete here by cutting it in place. So we'll dismantle everything, take the boards off, and then cut them and put them back on. So as you can see, I've dismantled things. I've taken the bricks away, taken the aluminium pieces off. You can sort of leave them in the general area they go so uh, you can quickly fit them back later. Now, once you're happy with the placement of the board, if you want to recheck anything, now's a good time. Just go around with a pencil and mark the outside edges there of that octagon. So just mark them. You can mark the front of the board so you can pull this away and just mark along the front of the boards because when we take these off to cut them, we don't want to have to re-measure and place everything when we put the boards back on. So there's no point in marking around here because we're chopping this, these parts off. So right now we're going to chop that part off, that part off, that part off and that part off. So I'm just going to use a handsaw to do it. You don't really need to watch me doing that. So I'll do that and I'll see you in a couple of minutes when it's done. And uh, we'll kick back into the next phase. I just thought since some of you at home might be thinking, hey, is this board actually easy to cut? I'll just give you a quick demo of how quick and easy it is to work with this product. dust, like I'm wearing a mask anyway, but it's better to be safe than sorry. Most of the dust sort of falls on the ground there, so you might want to put down some plastic while you're cutting it, before you be cutting it over. But yeah, really, really easy product to, uh, to cut through. So I'm just going to finish this now, and be back with you in a minute. Okay, so I have gone through and cut my boards. Um, I repositioned them according to my pencil lines that I've made previously. Uh, I found that one of my boards was a little bit wobbly, so uh, it's got a little bit of insulation under it, so it was sort of wobbling. So just double check that in hand, make sure it's sitting nice and firmly against the, uh, the concrete slab. Have a good sweep up and uh, make sure any sort of remnants are uh, taken away. Now because we're putting a mortar product on top of this insulation, and this insulation will absorb moisture, we want to protect or create a barrier between the two. So for that we're just going to use aluminium foil. So we're going to lay aluminium foil over here uh, and then we're going to take our pieces and we are going to screw them down into place. So you'll find some screws in the pack, just use a hand screwdriver. The, the, the insulation material isn't very strong in terms of being able to handle the power from a drill. So uh, if you must use a drill, make sure you turn the torque right back. But generally speaking, just a little hand screwdriver like this is, uh, is the way to go. So I'm going to carry on. I'll uh, see you in a couple of minutes when I've covered this in foil and screwed down my edging. So this is just a quick look at what I'm doing halfway through the process. So I have laid aluminium foil down and I've just held it down around the edges with the, the bits of aluminium, so sort of put them in place. What I did was I just moved that out slightly from the, under the insulation board underneath so I could tuck the aluminium foil down. It just made it a lot easier to make that edge nice and tidy. So I'm now just using the little screws in the pack and the uh, hand screwdriver. Now as I go, I'm making sure that the aluminium edges are sitting right on the edge of the insulation so we know that we're in the right spot. Make sure the little joints are tucked into each other and I'm just going to carry on and go around the whole, whole set and um, we'll be back with you in a minute. Right, I'm back and I have now gone around and successfully secured all the bits of aluminium boxing around the outside. So I've taken the screws up to just sort of hand tight. So just, you'll 
be tuning it, you're just gonna come up tight, and that's the amount of pressure we wanna have on them. So we're gonna use the top of this insulation boxing to cut across with a big stick or something, something nice and straight, to create a nice level floor for the fire bricks to sit on. The next step for us is to plan out and cut our fire bricks. So what we need to do is we need to configure the bricks in a way that they, they overlap, uh, but also that we can create a consistent and good looking pattern all the way through the oven. So I've started by just putting the full bricks, all the full bricks that I can in the oven. So it's a great starting point. These are just sort of roughly in the middle and uh, you'll see in a, in a minute why, uh, why we're doing this. Now what we're gonna do is use a little angle grinder with the cutting wheel provided to make the cuts in the bricks. So the good thing about this design is we're only making straight cuts. So we're not trying to do funny curves or anything like that. So uh, yeah, that's definitely a, a big advantage in terms of the time it takes and the technical skill required. The minimum things you'll need for cutting the bricks are earmuffs, mask, glasses, and gloves. Okay, so make sure you've got all those four. Um, it is a bit of a dusty process, so whatever you do, don't do it next to the uh, washing line if it's full of washing. So uh, I have taken the time to go and cut one of these now. So this particular brick fits here. And I've just set it up in place, and I've just, I can support it, and then I can, I can use my modified pencil. Now this is a, uh, a good test of how frugal you've been over the years with your building materials, your building, <laughs> building tools. Because if you've got a real nice short pencil like that, it's absolutely perfect for getting under here and marking along the aluminium so we know where to cut the brick. Now once you've made that mark, what we want to do is we want to take it a little bit further in. So we don't want the edge of the, the fire brick sitting on this aluminium edge because that might interfere with us getting it exactly level. So we're just going to measure seven or eight millimeters in further than our line so that we can take it past the edge of this aluminium here. Now you'll see I haven't cut that brick all the way through and there's really no need to. We're not going to see the outside of these bricks. They don't need to be neat and tidy. They don't need to be a perfect cut. They just need to be fitting inside the aluminium box in here. So I have cut this particular brick halfway through and then I can just put it on a sharp edge, and a sharp strong edge, probably use the concrete edge, and I can break it off, just like that. With this piece shaped, we can then do a quick check, just drop it into the gap there, make sure it's fitting, and we've got a little bit of a gap here between the uh, aluminium, which is fine. So then we just gotta work our way around doing the various cuts. So for example, if I'm doing the back cut here, I can lay this down. Just be a bit careful not to rip the tin foil. I mean, you know what tin foil is like. It's not very strong at the best of times. So um, we don't want to rip it all up with the uh, with the fire brick. So, and if you do rip it up, just do a, a, a small repair up using your trademark pencil. Just get underneath there and make your lines. And then, of course, you want to make another line, seven or eight mil in from this line. So for that, I'll just use something like a square, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make it square. I'm gonna follow the line that I've made. And then I'll just make another line, and then I'm ready to cut that brick. So just when you're cutting with the angle grinder, just a few hints. Firstly, make sure the guard is set so that the guard is in front of you. So any bits that fly off the blade don't come at your face or anything like that. Then run a series of cuts. So in the same cut, uh, just a series of light cuts. You can just basically use the weight of the angle grinder to make the cut. You don't want to dig it in because you're going to burn out the blade real fast because these are these are super hard bricks. So just gently roll across and once you're about halfway through, just snap the brick off and uh, happy days. Now when you're doing multi-cuts, so if for example you're doing this piece here and we need to cut that way and that way, You'll need to cut the short, the short part through all the way. So this part through here, you need to cut that all the way through the brick. But then when you cut the long piece, the long piece along the brick, you'll only need to cut halfway and you can snap that off. Very tricky to snap something that's take, uh, snap a cut that's taking multiple angles. So cut all the way through on the shorter angle, 
and then just halfway on the other bit and snap it off. So I'm going to go through and make my cuts now. I'll see you again soon and uh, we'll look at the next step of the process. Now I'm just going to throw in a quick note about cutting these fibrics because uh, if you're worried about the dust and you want to make things a little bit easier, soak these in a bucket of water. Soak the bricks that you're going to cut in a bucket of water first. So make sure you don't wash your pencil marks off. But chuck them in a bucket of water for a couple of minutes, won't do them any harm. Later on we're going to be dampening them down anyway and it'll just reduce some of the dust and, uh, and make the cutting a little bit easier. So yeah, just a quick little in there. I am back. I have successfully completed my cuts around here and everything is fitting in nicely within the aluminium boundary. So remember we don't want anything overhanging so it all fits in there nicely. Now I've used about a blade and a half to cut these bricks. So if you're not very experienced cutting bricks and using an angle grinder, you might want to just take a photo of the type of disc we provide in the kit. So you can take that to the hardware store if you do need to grab a few more. The key reason that you'll wear out blades quickly is you're pressing too hard when you're cutting. So just be aware of that. Also, don't try and chip parts off the edge of the brick with a hammer. These are very, very brittle, these bricks. They're not like a standard house brick at all. So they're very brittle, and if you hit it in the wrong place, you're likely to break them, which can be a real pain. If you do break one, just make sure it's at the back of the oven where you're never going to see it again. It's going to be covered in ash and fire and things like that. The other point is make sure you clearly mark the line you're cutting on your brick. So you might want to sort of scribble out the, the mark you make initially from running it along the aluminium, just so when you are cutting, you don't end up doing extra work. But apart from that, it's all really straightforward, and uh, we have a floor that is ready to go. We are now going to go around and just mark where each brick goes in the sequence. We're not worried about the full bricks, we're just worried about the small bricks. So I'm just going to grab a pencil, and I can just go along here and write whatever sequence you want, so it doesn't really matter, as long as it works for your brain to be honest, I can give you a sequence, but you're better off picking your own way of remembering where it's going. If you're a little bit worried, you can just write, say, a big number on them, and then take a photo of it, so it's quite a good way of doing it. Uh, and that way we're going to remember quite easily where everything's going. Now, things are starting to get exciting. We have done a lot of great work here in our preparation, and like anything, preparation is the key. So we are now going to be adding 30 kilos of refractory mortar into this area here, so we can create a beautiful flat floor in our pizza oven. Now, this product here is a high temperature mortar, so it's not an ordinary mortar. You can see it's got a bit of a strange smell to it, but it's really important that we get the amount of water we put into it extremely accurate. We're going to use a measuring jug. Okay, this one's a thousand, thousand mils. Um, as you can see, my one's due to go for a warranty, but hey, if it measures, it measures. Just find something that's going to allow you to measure out 4.6 litres of water. So 4.6 litres of water exactly. We're going to put that into our mixing bucket and then we're going to add our mortar. So that just helps um, avoid dry spots down the bottom if you put your water in first. So one thing I'll just quickly add is that for mixing this mortar, a little spade is actually really, really handy. So just a little strong kid spade or something like that is great for getting stuck in and mixing the mortar in the bucket. So if you're using um, a bigger spade, it can sort of be a little bit hard to turn. So just a good little point is to use that. Now on the on the packet, it, uh, there's a few instructions on how to mix it, but it's pretty straightforward. It does say to mix it for eight minutes, which is quite a long time when you're mixing it by hand. But the more time you can give the mixing process, the better. You're also going to find that a product like this, which sets in about an hour, okay, is going to start becoming a little bit unworkable quite quickly. So we've got to move quite quickly when we're doing this. We don't want to be sort of mucking around too long in our process going through and laying the floor to find that the end's gone sort of too hard for us to work with. So just bear that in mind. So I'm now going to take that mortar, I'm going to pour it into my bucket. Um, I'm going to use, because I don't want to get sweaty for a video, a little electric mixer, but um, more than likely you're going to be using a little spade. So we'll see you in a little bit when it's all mixed up and we'll lay the floor. Right, so I have been mixing my material over here. So this is a uh, heavy duty, heavy duty mixer that I have. You're, you're unlikely to have one of those, but if you do know somebody's got one, then they're pretty handy to have. 
um, otherwise you'll be mixing it by hand. You get a look and see it's quite sloppy to start with and you're going to think, gee, have I put too much water in? But then it's going to get firmer and firmer and firmer. Now after you've been mixing it for a while and you think everything, all the ingredients are well churned up inside, then I want you to just leave that bucket for about five minutes. And it's going to give us an opportunity to, uh, to do some other things and set things up. Once we've left it for about five minutes, we're going to remix it again. And that just reactivates things and gives a far more workable uh, plaster here. So I've worn a dusk mask while I'm pouring the material and during the initial mix, once things have sealed down, you don't really need one of those. But um, yeah, just, just be aware, you don't want to be breathing this sort of stuff in. So what we're going to do is create a nice flat floor for our fire bricks. And we're going to use basically something like this. Now I'm lucky enough to have a, a level that's the right length. It just needs to be something flat and nice and straight that can go right across both sides. So we can work our way up and across the whole oven. So you can see by keeping whatever straight edge you're using on one side and the other, we're going to get a dead flat floor all the way across. And that's a great starting point for us to, to lay our floor. It really needs to be 100mm wider each side uh, than the, the width of the oven. So you're looking at something that's about a metre long will be handy. If you don't have anything at all that you can use, maybe try a broom handle or something, but make sure you sight it to make sure it looks nice and flat. We're not actually using the level as the level here, we're just keeping the floor nice and flat for the oven. So in your, in your pack, if you've got the mid-range pack and the premium pack, you'll see a little trowel. The little plastic trowel is brilliant for working the mortar over here. Now as I've said, we're under a bit of time pressure, so what we're going to do is just pick up our pieces, we're going to set them up around the edges so we know we're ready to go. We'll see you back in a minute. Right, so in the five minutes that I've had uh, while I was waiting for my mortar to, uh, to set a little bit, I have set up my fire bricks. I have placed the, uh, the cut fire bricks in piles that I understand so that as I go, I know they'll be nice and quick to lay. So just wanted to mention, not all fire bricks are, uh, are made equal. So they're a bit of a fickle beast to manufacture and they don't always come out perfect. So as you go lifting your full, your full bricks up here, just sort them into piles according to how, how good they are. So flip them over, have a look. So here I have my first grade ones and they're the ones that I'm going to put right at the front here. I have my second grade ones, that's going to be the second line. And I have my third grade ones, which they're still fine. It's just there, might be a little bit rougher. Uh, that are going to be in the back row, which you're never going to see, and they're going to be covered by fire and soot and stuff like that. So once we've achieved that, it's uh, time to do that remix. So I've already done the remix, and I'm now going to start pouring or placing the mortar onto the oven space here. So I'm going to start at the front, and I'm going to work my way back here. I'm going to pick up again in a minute, so I'll come back to you in a couple of minutes once I've started the process and uh, we'll just go through the levelling and placing of those fire bricks. This is just a quick jump in to show you I've started the process. So I've been laying my refractory mortar up here. I've put my level here, hard up against this aluminium bar, and then I've just wiggle, 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 wiggle. And the more wiggling the better, all the way across. Okay, so then I'm going to leave that on there, and you can re-spread it. Pulled away a little bit, and I can see, because I'm not hitting any mortar now, that there's a little dip in the middle there I need to go back over. So I'm just going to put a big blob there, okay, and then I can hit that again. So I can just start over here, and it'll start catching the mortar. You see it catches the mortar up here, and the more you wiggle back and forth, the smoother you're going to get. So, you can see there's just a hollow through here. So I'm just going to work my way across, uh, fixing up those little um, those little pieces and getting it nice and level. See you again in a minute. The future has arrived. So I've just gone and filled it all in. I have gone over with my big long level to make sure it's flat. And then I've just sort of smoothed it off with the, uh, the plastic float just to make it look pretty for the camera, to be honest. Okay, now the next part is to lay the refractory floor bricks. Now we've separated them into piles, so you want to make sure you use the right pile. Best thing to use is a little rubber mallet. Okay, so it just means we can just gently tap the brick down into place and one side's a little bit higher against the next. So we can just sort of work our way across. 
You don't necessarily need one, just use a bit of wood or something to tap it down gently. Just don't use a normal hammer, okay? You're gonna break the bricks, so you don't wanna do that. So I'm just gonna go across the front. These are my good bricks. I'm staying inside the aluminium so that I have the ability to move it up and down. If I don't, I'm not gonna have the ability to move it up and down. Oops, gotta make sure I use the right pile. Good lesson for you. Nice and close together. Make sure you don't push that front edge too far away. And there we have it, our first line. Now I can see this one is just slightly raised. I can rub my finger across here and gently tap. You can see this side's gently raised against that one. Gently tap and it just... Tap it in. Feels beautiful. That's all I'm going to do. I'm not going to touch it anymore, okay? Now it's just a matter of laying the rest of our bricks. So I know this was my secondary pile. They go in the middle there. Okay, and you can see Really easy level. Don't whack it. Whatever you do, just give it a little number of little taps is way better. You don't want to go too far. Okay, and just get these nice and flat against each other. And that's why it's so good working with mortar. Okay, I'm really happy with that way that's coming up. I'm going to go through and put the rest of my pieces on until the jigsaw is complete. I'll see you in a minute. That's the floor completed. So I have just gone back and I've put the pieces in the order that I, uh, I marked them in. I've given them a very small tap down to make them nice and level with my rubber mallet. As I say, use a piece of wood. And then I've just gone over with my, my level of straight edge and just check there's no gaps underneath. But I am very, very happy with that floor. It is beautiful and flat. So it's going to make a great uh, cooking surface. A couple of people have mentioned to me that um, perhaps you want to look at a herringbone pattern, which is basically putting the, the bricks on an angle and running them over. Um, people say that you perhaps don't catch your pizza peel as much if you've got one brick sticking up, but you've still got edges sticking up. So to be honest, it's not worth the hassle for me uh, in building it, but um, if you want to go down that track, there should be enough bricks to do it anyway, so uh, give it a go. But um, this to me is a, a a great pattern and it looks awesome from uh, from the front of the oven. So that's our floor done. Now I just want to talk about one of the greatest mistakes you can make doing this floor and that is to do it in a direct sunlight. So this mortar will go off like you won't believe in bright sunshine and warm weather. So just be as careful as you can to either do it like early in the morning or better still get a shade cloth so you can just cruise and not be worried. So we're going to let this set and we're going to come back uh, as soon as tomorrow and um, start building the rest of our oven. But a lot of the hard work's been done. This is going to be a superb floor and it's going to be an amazing oven. So let's carry on the adventure. Now I just want to add a quick note. If your oven base is exposed to the elements and it's looking like it's going to rain or there is a chance it's going to rain, make sure you cover everything. The last thing we want to do is get a whole lot of water into our insulation before we've had a chance to protect it and, uh, and set all our waterproofing around. So just you can use the uh, the arch bricks and that sort of thing to, to hold the plastic out if you like because we're going to be soaking them and making them wet later on anyway. Uh, but yeah, just make sure you cover it so it doesn't rain on it and uh, soak in a whole lot of uh, moisture there.